So there's some impressive examples of banks that have gone from uh, the traditional model, paper-based uh, physical infrastructure. Development Bank of Singapore yes. is, is a case. Would you, could they show the way for others? Um, mm. I, you know, I'm wondering uh, yes. aloud if DBS is an example of, mm. of the way in which old banks could migrate, or do you think that yeah. old banking model is done? I'll never say the old banking model is done. I think the the the, the 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 sheer depth of of institutional capacity capability, okay. and the um, and the competitive advantage of that scale, uh, you must never underestimate. Also remember that what I'm talking about is a small corner of banking. Sure. So we do Fair consumer point. mass market consumer banking, and we do small business banking. And if you look at Standard Bank's world, um, that's, you know, that's arguably a very small part of their, of, if you look at their balance sheet, their income statement, how they make their money, and it's a small part of what banking does in the world. So you've got all the whole world of business and in investment banking and so on out there, uh, balance sheet management at scale and treasury management at scale and so on. We're not, we, we've picked a small part of the world where we, which is big in the sense that it affects many people's lives, but from a banking balance sheet perspective is a small part of the story. If, is there a prospect, possibility that one day Time Bank could have Time Corporate Investment Banking? Is that not, remotely possible? Not while I'm there. I sort of did a lot of my first part of my career in M&A working with investment bankers uh, and had a stint um, on uh, NetBank's uh, Corporate Exco. I think it's a very different business requiring a very different set of skills. And my conviction in terms of where business is today is that the truly world-class institutions in future will likely be specialists rather than generalists. Yeah. And, and I think the reason for that is if you think about the arguments for building a big conglomerate with everything inside the business and the argument for building a business that is sort of much narrower, um, I think the dynamics, technology, and the way the world works has changed the strategic trade-offs in building those two kinds of businesses. Um, and it, it, it requires a bit more time to talk through it, but I'll try and be succinct. Um, what I think is that the frictional cost of doing business with another business has gone down dramatically. Okay. And the frictional cost of doing different things in the same business has gone up dramatically. Um, the reason th the frictional cost of doing business with other people have gone down is because of how easy it is now through open a APIs and through, through loosely coupled service-based architectures to get businesses, systems, and processes to speak to each other across different businesses. Mm. So w where we see time going is we want to be really good at a few things and well connected to other people who are really good at a few things. Um, and typically people are really good at just one thing. Um, the reason the frictional cost of doing everything in one business has gone up is because of governance and internal governance and processes within organizations that have become more and more complex, particularly in high re highly regulated industries. So ironically, in some respects, it's easier for me to do bus business with Standard Bank's treasury than it would be if I was sitting in Standard Bank and trying to do, hmm. to do business with the same treasury team doing the same things because of the levels of governance and process and so on, potential conflicts of interest, different, different uh, 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 managers having different priorities, trying to trade things off against each other.